Wow, very nice. Who's the guy over the mantelpiece? Look at that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, I thought we'd just jump straight in. Mm -hmm. um, I would start by asking, so you initially were interested in pursuing animation mm -hmm. before you decided to pursue a career in acting. That's right. What inspired you to then choose the profession you're currently in? And do you still keep up drawing as a creative outlet? Well, believe it or not, acting was a more lucrative uh, form of m making a living <laughs> than being an animator. <laughs> being a professional animator, you basically don't do anything. You do nothing. And so I, uh, I realized that quickly when I tried to do some animation stuff. I lived in Seattle mm -hmm. for a while and I, I tried to do it and I didn't succeed at all at it. And I was actually making money to, uh, being an actor, doing pretty crappy things, <laughs> but I was actually making money doing it. So I was deceived into thinking it was gonna be easy being an actor, mm -hmm. so I chose to be an actor. Do I still, I don't really draw much anymore, no, which is sad. Uh, I really loved it. I used to draw my characters, particularly when I acted on stage more. I don't know why, but I used to draw them. I used to also play much more sort of grotesque, strange things. Yeah. I mean, I still do play grotesque, <laughs> strange things, but they're more naturalistic, yeah. grotesque, strange <laughs> things. I did a lot more kind of exaggerated, almost like clowny mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. So my drawing had a lot to do with that. Um, but I don't do it much anymore. I lost the knack for it, yeah. I think. You actually mentioned then your ventures on stage. I know you reprised your role as Hamlet in 2013 back at Yale University. I didn't reprise it, I just oh, no, played, you it played it. Again. I played you it again. Played no, it again. I didn't you played it's it not again. like I played it a million yeah, yeah. times, but yeah. Um, <laughs> but for you, do you enjoy theatre work more than perhaps TV and film? Do you find it a more exhilarating medium? Yes, Yeah. for sure. Is it because of the audience's reaction or is it just the idea that you can take a new approach at a character every single night? Well, you can't take a totally new approach to the character every night. That would be hard for the other actors <laughs> yeah. if you just started screaming. Mean, but I know what you mean. You get to endlessly tinker yeah. with the thing every night. Yeah, I mean, the audience reaction is great. That's part of it for sure. But I always liked actually the fact that everything's unfolding in real time. Mm -hmm. You know, that you actually, and you're in real space mm -hmm. too. And you're in a lot of space, which I also really liked mm -hmm. um, because I, I liked having all of that room to fill, you know, being pretty hammy and over the top was, was great on stage. And so I, I really enjoyed that. And everything's happening in, on a continuum in time. You know, if you watch somebody performing an activity on stage, you're watching the whole thing. It's not all chopped up, you know. I've never felt the kind of exhilaration doing film that I felt on stage, which can be a real amazing, you know, high. I've never felt that. Mm -hmm. Films always felt very confining to me. Mm -hmm. And do you feel with perhaps slightly bigger blockbusters, for example, Spider-Man, where you played Rhino, yeah. does it kind of lose, <laughs> does it sort of lose yeah. some of the magic of the acting profession when you're <sighs> having to do a take again and it's very much your part of like a cog in like this machine? Why'd you pick that one? It's I interesting. Know, yeah, I know. What? No, that's interesting you picked that one. <laughs> Yeah, that was a whole unbelievable cock up in general, that whole thing. <laughs> um, I mean, that was just such a bizarre, that, that was a great example though of like the way film, this isn't gonna really gonna be answering your question, but I, I can just bitch about having to play the rhino. Yeah. <laughs> and finally. Um, that was such a bizarre thing because I got that part and I was playing Hamlet when I got that yeah. part. And I was like, I was playing Hamlet. And I was like, they were like, do you want to play the rhino in Spider-Man 2? And I was like, sure, sure, sure. And then I go on stage and play Hamlet and I'm exhausted. And, I wasn't even, and then that ended, Hamlet ended. And they were like, okay, now you got to go play the rhino in Spider-Man. And I was like, I, I do? I forgot I said I would play. Ugh, the whole thing was just. But it was interesting because. That's such a funny, you know, I took that part and I learned everything in Russian and all this mm -hmm. stuff and I did all this stuff and we filmed it and I think they showed it to an audience and the audience was like, why is that guy speaking Russian? What is going on? <laughs> What's going on in this movie? Who is that guy? So I had to, they chopped it up, they chopped it up and I had to redub the whole thing in a terrible Russian accent in a room that I sat in. And so, you know, that's what I mean. It's yeah. like, I would have loved to have played the rhino on stage. Yeah like a stage, a stage musical of, of the Rhino. But you know, it was like, I thought that was gonna be more fun than it was. I thought it was gonna be more sort of expansive than it was. And it kind of wasn't, it was a little disappointing. Mm -hmm. 
I know, that answered your question. It did, yeah, it did, yeah. And we got those spice as well, it's great. (laughs) Um, You also once said that when you were playing your characters in Barney's version, you liked it because you got to play everything. So for you, kind of like with the rhino, what draws you to play a character? That's not when you're like delirious after being on stage. Right, exactly, and I'm not sure what drew me to play the rhino. (laughs) Um, but what, what is the thing that draws you for a character? What do you look for in a script and like, oh, this would be a character that I'd love to bring alive? Mm. It's hard, to, I don't, and I never really know. I mean, with that, I guess I said I, I got to play everything in it. Did mm. I say that somewhere? Mm, yeah. I probably did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, that guy had enormous emotional range. I mean, it was all up and down and up and down. It was all over the place, and that was sort of fun to do. Mm. I never, I don't really know what's gonna interest me. First of all, and this is going to sound really flippant, but it's true, I have to just be compelled to keep reading the script, to actually keep turning the pages of the script. And um, that's a big thing, actually. I have to actually be interested in the story, actually, and want to be in that particular story and have a part that's exciting because it's in that story. So I don't really, I don't know what that's going to be, though. I never quite know. And I've been lucky in my career that I've been able to sort of go, well, I'll play the rhino and I'll play this guy in, in, in Barney's version. Yeah. I've been really lucky that, yeah. that way. You know, I've had that kind of character actor's career. Mm. In kind of that sense, I think early on in your career, you kind of usually played more antagonistic villainous roles. And did you have to... Early in my career? And so I mean, still a bit, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, do you find that you have to... F- sort of find a redeeming quality in those characters to empathize with their actions? Or do you kind of just enjoy just playing like a dirty villain? And yeah, I mean, it depends, sure. Sometimes I enjoy playing a dirty villain. I did a really silly movie called, um, <laughs> the hell's that movie called? Shoot 'em Up, that's what it's <laughs> called. And I don't know, has anybody ever seen this movie? Does anybody know this movie? It's, oh yeah, you, of course you do. Um, it's a really ridiculous, cartoony, super violent action movie. And the whole point of the movie is it's just violent. That's all it is. And I play this ridiculously villainous, violent guy. And I gotten offered a lot of these kinds of parts. And a lot of the time they weren't, they weren't disgusting and villainous enough. And this guy was really bad. I mean, this guy's trying to kill a baby in the movie and he's a sort of, he's possibly a necrophiliac and stuff. And I was like, that's great. I'll play that. And I was like, yeah, he was just purely bad. And that's the only reason to have done that was it was just fun playing a ridiculously bad guy. But other things, sure. I mean, like the guy in Billions is a, mm. could be totally seen as the, the bad guy of that show if you wanted to see it that way. Mm. He's a villainous character in a lot of ways, Machiavellian mm. villain sort of thing. And uh, I like him, you know, and I think there's lots of positive qualities to him. And so I suppose I have to find them. I think I just... I think I just instinctively do anyway about those characters. I don't, I, I don't even approach them in the first place as saying I think they're bad guys or evil or something. Mm-hmm. So I suppose so, yeah. So the kind of getting into the mindset for playing these sorts of characters, your role in 12 Years a Slave was obviously a very heavy one. Do you find, how do you cope with dealing with the emotional overhang of playing such a role and kind of getting into that headspace and then be able to go home at the end of the day and kind of get on with normal life? Well, you know, it can be tricky. I mean, I think part of being a professional actor is being able to let go of it, mm-hmm. is being able to just click into and out of things, you know? I mean, I think it's the aspect of actors that's slightly sociopathic, <laughs> you know? I mean, we're sort of compartmentalizing people in some way that's, that's kind of strange. And so, I mean, I think there's, to a certain degree, that can happen. Mm-hmm. You know, that's an interesting, part in that movie, um, you know, it wasn't a pleasant character to play, obviously, and, um, but you know, it depends again on the sort of the emotional territory the guy, I, I objectively viewed, and, and in doing it, it was not a pleasant thing to have to be standing there slapping people around and selling them, it was horrible, but the guy himself is having a great time doing it. He's like a, I talked to a friend of mine who's a Civil War historian who said these guys were the car salesmen, used car salesmen of their time. You know, you, you, you had to go to these guys mm-hmm. to get the product they were selling. And they made a lot of money. And I looked at some of the stuff some of these guys wrote and they enjoyed it. You know, it was, and so one of the things that was terrifying about the guy is how much he was enjoying it. So the actual emotional space I had to occupy was a guy who was having a good time. Mm-hmm. And so that was, 
in the actual playing of it, not that, not that horrible in a weird way. We cut and it was awful to sit there and then have to do it again. But weirdly actually doing it, I was playing a person who was so a part of this awful system, he just didn't even think twice about it. Which is, I think, one of the interesting things about that part of the movie and that movie, too, is that it sort of portrays it as just this given, this Kafka-esque, upside down, down the rabbit hole insanity that everybody just accepted as totally normal. You know, and so, but I think to some extent you've become hardened to it and you can just let it go mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Um, because at the end of the day, thank God, it's not a documentary. You're not, you know, enacting the real thing. Mm -hmm. So, but um, I'm sure it's damaged me to some extent <laughs> <laughs> as a human being. You know, I don't think you can get away totally unscathed by it. Kind of that idea then of normalizing something that's crazy. Mm -hmm. You could say that Billions, to an extent, does do that. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the show makes it have such an insatiable appetite with the audience that they're happy to watch something that very much perpetuates ideas of greed, gluttony, mm -hmm. and just like an obsession with Something power? Something that we should be horrified yeah, by. Yeah, but actually we can't actually stop looking away. I don't know. I mean, in America at least, you know, I mean, we've, we, we love those guys. You know, and we really idolize those guys. I suppose here we do too. I suppose all over the world and throughout human history, everybody's idolized those guys for some reason. You know, they're seen as, you know, godlike in some weird way, infallible and stuff. And they, um, I, I, you know, I think people are just turned on by the villainy and stuff like that. And um, it's just enjoyable to watch these guys go at each other. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's a, it's a, you know, the show suddenly became relevant in a totally different way, you know, when Trump was, was elected. And that was an interesting shift in the show. And I don't know how people are looking at it now, necessarily, in America. I think it was a little bit more fun before, and it might not be so fun <laughs> now, you know, because you're like, well, Axelrod could be president yeah. if he wanted to. And, you know, and I actually said to them, maybe you should have him run for president. You know, and so it's gotten complicated in a way that I'm not sure how people are looking at the show now. It, the show has to walk a finer line mm -hmm. now, too. Uh, at least the guys who created it see it that way. I don't, you know. <coughs> but why do people get turned on by those guys? Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know. It's, uh, why are people turned on by that kind of alpha behavior? I don't know. You know, but people are, and it's an unfortunate thing, mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you see the show now more of a critique of sort of a Trump world, or do you think it's, to an extent, maybe plays up to it? It's a fine line. That's what I mean. You know, it's a very fine line. I mean, I think that they are offering up a critique, but that critique can be very sexy to people. Mm -hmm. It's like, I always feel this way about depictions of like heroin addiction on film. You can never actually make it so disgusting that it's somehow still not romanticized. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There's, there's some way in which it's always going to be appealing in some sick way, no matter how awful you make it look. And actually, the more awful you make it look, the more somebody will be like, wow, that looks really cool. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm going to go smoke some heroin. <laughs> you know, and that's crazy. And I think the same thing kind of holds true with this. Actually, in some ways, the worse you make these guys look, the more appealing they seem to be. And it's funny, you make the federal government guys look bad in pursuit of the, com the common good and they just look like jerks mm -hmm. somehow. It's interesting and no matter what you do, it's going to always end up being like that. And I do think the show is pointing that up in some ways, mm -hmm. is saying that it's like, you know, we continue to think these guys are so great. The criminal ones, I mean, they're not all obviously criminals, mm -hmm. but you know. Mm -hmm. so. Do you think now more than ever, Hollywood or cinema or film, TV, whatever, has a part to play in being responsible for that behavior, illuminating it, criticizing it? Or do you think Hollywood should remain an apolitical sort of body where it's... I don't know. That's a really good question. Yeah. I mean, and one that I would normally have said to you, no, just, you know, it's entertainment. Stop shoving yeah. something down somebody's throats and moralizing and wagging your fingers in their faces. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little bit more like, no, we need to actually, <laughs> we need to actually make this efficacious for people, make it healthy for people show them what's bad about this stuff. But that's not entertaining to people. Mm. Moralizing is just a drag, mm. you know? And people don't, people don't want to watch that, really. Yeah. You know, and I don't blame them. Yeah. But I don't, that's a really good question. You know, I don't know. 
it's a business. People want to make money. Mm. Got to maybe stay more neutral. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm now going to open the questions to the floor because I know many of you are dying to ask Giamatti, Mr. Giamatti, some questions. I liked you just calling me Giamatti. That's good. I know. So as I said, I, was like, I did. I kind of <laughs> liked that. Giamatti. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, remember in the pink shirt. Um, thanks for coming. Yeah. So sticking with Billions for a moment, one of my favorite elements of the show is the relationship um, that your character Chuck Rhodes has with his father, mm -hmm. um, who, who does an, also does a really good job in, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. And um, so I'm wondering what sort of sources you draw upon when you sort of think of that father-son relationship <laughs> and, and that element of the character, because yeah. obviously it comes ahead in season two. I mean, I won't give anything away. Yeah. Um, I mean, you don't have to give like real world examples, although Elliot Spitzer sort of does sort of ring a bell in that sense. But uh -huh. what sort of, you know, canonical examples of, that you look at to draw inspiration to draw from for the father son thing? Yeah, or that component of the of wow. your character. Um, it's funny. I hadn't really thought of it anything really particularly beyond just what's there sort of as it's presented. I mean, there's ways in which I'm familiar with what they're the kind of guy they're dramatizing with the father. You know, my, my father was an academic and he was the president of Yale University. My character is supposed to have gone to Yale University. I'm completely familiar with the kind of guys that that father is supposed to be. My dad wasn't like that, but I know those guys. And there's a lot of that, actually. And it is actually more personal than just simply thinking about sort of classic father-son struggles. You know, I, I just, I, I, know, I know exactly the world and those kinds of guys and stuff like that. So unfortunately, I haven't thought about it that much except just kind of playing what's there, I think, to some extent. I don't know if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm a little jet lagged, so I may be rambling. It's <laughs> 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 great. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yes, if we can pass to the member in the hat, the baseball hat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi, thanks so much for being here. Um, I'm an actor, and I wanted to know, was there a point in your acting career where you said to yourself, you know, it might be easier to be a, a professor, mm -hmm. a prosecutor, anything else, and what yeah, made yesterday. you keep going? Yeah, yesterday. yesterday. <laughs> Walking around here. Yeah, and, uh, yeah <laughs> This would have been an easier thing to do. It's not a bad gig, but yeah, uh, no, it was, uh, what sort of made you keep going when you had those doubts? Ah. Uh, I've definitely had those moments of thinking, oh my God, why, what have I done to myself? Um, why did I do this? And I think one of the major things that kept me going was something always did come along. I mean, you know, no matter what it was, something did come along. And even I, I would just continue to just try to dig into the work I had to do. And that generally always reminded me of why I was putting myself through all this stuff. Um, it was probably mostly that. I mean, I had lots of friends who weren't actors, and actually that helped a lot. Seriously. <laughs> you know, I mean, knowing people who weren't involved in it, being able to get away from it and come back to it was actually a really good thing to be able to do, you know. But a lot of it was just a kind of blind faith that something decent was going to come, <laughs> was going to come along. It's a really depressing answer, isn't it? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, and I honestly, I wasn't qualified to even be a cartoonist, you know what I mean? It was the only thing, I mean, people will say this, and it sounds sort of, I always get a little annoyed when people say this, but I, I'm going to say it, and I can't believe I'm saying it, but, you know, it, it's something you have to be completely 110% sure it's what you want to do. You know, and then that'll keep you going too, because you just there's nothing else to do. You know, there's just well, I, I can't do anything else. I, you know, I, I really can't. I couldn't have been a professor. It would have been horrible. <laughs> it would have been such a joke <laughs> if I had been a professor. I couldn't have been a cartoonist. That would have been ridiculous. You know, so. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. We can pass it to the member just behind you. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> I'll find the script. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, hello, thanks for coming here. Um, so, the first movie I ever saw you in was uh, Big Fat Liar, uh -huh. and uh, I'm kind of harkening back to that because um, I wanted to know one is that an example of what you were saying that earlier on in your career you were more clown-like mm -hmm. and more out there, and then 
given where you are now with all these more serious roles you take on, do you think you could ever go back to that more um, comedic, screwball-y type style? Yeah, I would love to, actually. I mean, I'd, I'd like to do more stuff like that. Um, I did, that is more like the kind of thing I used to do more of, you know, and I did this not very good Planet of the Apes movie. Um, and, but it was, I loved doing it because I got to be completely covered in prosthetics and, and got trained in how to like pick up a glass and stuff like a monkey. And it was like, this is fantastic. <laughs> you know, and it was like, that was one of my favorite things I've ever done. It's not a very good movie, but it didn't, didn't matter. Um, so I would love to do more of that kind of stuff for sure. Um, I have, I'm gonna, I just took a job largely because I get to do something really strange and goofy in it. And um, I miss doing that kind of thing a lot. Um, it's just a different thing and, and really fun. I get tired of realism and naturalism and it's boring in some ways. You know, I just get very bored <laughs> with it. Anyway. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, if you could pass it to the member right at the back of the room. That'd be great. Thank you. The member over there. Yeah. <laughs> the member, the member. <laughs> Thank you very much um, for coming along. Um, Given, so the Avengers of Infinity Wars are currently in cinemas um, and it seems to be a lot of action films going on. Do you think that that's going to be the future for actors now? These, either you're paying two-dimensional super villains or super heroes um, forever or do you think, given the fact that the cost of film is um, decreasing so rapidly, you can shoot on like an iPhone or anything like uh. that, there's going to be more opportunities for more complex films and more interesting actors. Where do, you, where do you sit on that, given you've played, you know, both sides of that? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think in some ways the future of any kind of like that sort of going to, this, going to the cinema on a big screen kind of thing might, for the foreseeable future, be pretty much sustained by Avenger movies <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> you know, I mean, for a while, it has been for a while, and now it really kind of looks like it might be. And so that kind of experience might be ruled by that stuff, you know, f to a certain extent. But you're right that now, I mean, I just saw that Steven Soderbergh movie he shot all on his phone mm -hmm. called Unsane. Anybody see that movie? Did it come here? It's not very good. <laughs> <laughs> but he did shoot it all on his phone and it looks really cool and the acting's really good in it. And in a way, I think that was what's interesting about it. And I even think that's why he did it. I don't even think he cared that much about the story and stuff. So, you know, there'll be parallel tracks, it seems like, you know. It do, it's great that you can do all this other stuff on your phone and, um, so that it's not all just going to be superhero movies, but, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. There's a member back there. Yeah, yeah. There's a member yeah, you right can there. choose. <laughs> Remember in, like, the marine jumper. Nice. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for coming, Paul. Yeah. Um, I think Sideways is a brilliant film. Thanks. And I just think so much of the humour in your character comes from how serious he is and his, his love of wine. <laughs> and I, I just want to know if, um, if you were a wine connoisseur before Sideways, mm -hmm. and if you weren't, are you one now? <laughs> no, no and no. I didn't, I didn't know anything about it beforehand. But I was, I was fascinated by those people who are really into it. And that whole thing was really interesting to me. No, I wasn't before. And I'm not now either. Um, I used to drink wine, you know, I'd drink it if it was there. And lately I've actually been kind of tired. I don't like drinking wine anymore. I just don't like it. So I drink other kinds of alcoholic beverages, <laughs> but no wine anymore. And I don't know anything about it. And I, and I, I find myself crushing some people's illusions sometimes because they really, really want me to be a wine expert. And, they, and I'm, glad, I'm glad that I convinced them that I seem like I actually was one, but I don't know anything about it. Funnily enough, the other guy, Tom Church, he knew way more about wine than I did. And it's very funny to hear him go on and on about it, but, but no, unfortunately, I didn't know anything about it. The member in the uh, striped shirt. Yeah, there you go. The member yeah. in the striped shirt, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's fun, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wore this so that I would stand out. Nice, that's good. Uh, good, good idea. Um, so, thanks for the really interesting talk so far. <laughs> um, 
playing John Adams uh, for HBO must have been interesting. Um, I, I study history, and he's kind of like the least sexy founding father. Yeah. So, I made sure I made him even less sexy. <laughs> well, I, I was going to ask, you know, did, I just made him did you have terrible. to do anything to kind of like educate yourself about why he needed a, a miniseries about him anyway? <laughs> you know, because you did a good job. Thanks. Of doing that. Yeah. Um, I did educate. I mean, I I was just saying to somebody else that. You know, there's such a vast literature on this. I could only do a little bit. And, and then I just took a lot of liberties with it from what I, you know, I just had to go with it because it's a fictional character, ultimately, what I'm going to do in there. I can, I can base lots of things in whatever reality there was, but I can't. Um, uh, it was a, a tricky part. But what did you, what, what did you ask me again <laughs> exactly? Like, you know, did you, did you have to bring anything to it to the role, yeah. I guess, yeah. What, what, what were the fictional dimensions, I suppose? I got really fascinated by certain things. I mean, I, um, one of the most interesting pieces of research I came across wasn't anything I actually found. It, one of the makeup guys found it. And it was, I don't know where he got it from, but some scholar had uh, taken all of the references to his own health that he had made in the letters mostly to his wife. And it was page after page after page after page of close typed, I have a headache, my eyes hurt, I have diarrhea, my stomach is shot, my feet hurt, I can't sleep, I have a headache, I have diarrhea. <laughs> it went on and on and on. He was an out of control hypochondriac. <laughs> I've taken to bed for two weeks, I can't get out of bed. He was constantly collapsing like that, which we would now in a reductive way say he was probably bipolar or something, because it sounds like it, you know? And that was just amazing to me and odd and sort of, you know, and so I, I put some things in there like that. I, I thought the relationship with his children was interesting and a lot of people would just say, well, he was just this kind of, oh, you know, such good values and he seemed like a terrible father, actually, you know, and so that was interesting. I mean, I brought all these horrible negative things to it. I think they wanted to do a show about him precisely because he wasn't very well known and he was a bit of a everyman kind of guy. He was sort of, and he was everywhere. He was all over the place. He was here, he was in America for all out of the action, but then he was here in Europe. He was in Paris and he was in Holland and stuff and he was all over the place and that was interesting though too. But I also think there was an eye towards subverting for Americans, a lot of the mythical stature of these guys. And so they picked the guy who was a notorious pain in the ass and a terrible politician, terrible president, really basically kind of a political philosopher and an intellectual, really. He hated the whole thing. And so I think that's why they also picked him, because it wasn't Thomas Jefferson, who we all know and love, and isn't he great? You know, and, and Washington, who we all know and love, and isn't he just great? You know, and it was like, no, it's John Adams, who we don't know, and he's a pain in the ass. <laughs> you know, and I just thought, I really relished doing that. I had a good time doing that, dismantling some of that stuff. Anyway. Hey, hey, the member in the front Is that it? Yeah, no that. members? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh-oh, member up here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, did you uh, do your own singing in duets? And I was wondering if you did, if you had to do a lot of training for it. I did do my own singing in that movie. Um, and no, I didn't do any training for it, <laughs> which was part of the point, you know? I mean, they didn't, it's this movie called Duets, which you've seen, which amazes me that anybody no, has seen honestly, this movie. It's no, it's on fantastic. Of my dad, actually. Do you love it? No, he, I haven't seen it yet, but he <laughs> asked. <laughs> awesome, your father I, wanted to know? I is that what you told him, me? I asked him it's today. your father's favorite movie? Yeah, I asked him today, and I was like, oh, do you know this actor? And he's like, oh, I love this actor. Can you ask him this film, <laughs> about this film for me? That's awesome. I mean, my favorite <laughs> film of yours is Big Fat Liar. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh, yeah, yeah. Right. But yeah, this you, movie I did called Duets dad. where I have to sing in it. And it's all, about, it's all about professional karaoke singers. People who make money going around from contest to contest making money. And uh, they asked me when I auditioned for, because I play a guy who's not supposed to be a singer. He just discovers he loves doing it. And they asked me when I uh, auditioned for it, it, do I sing? And I was like, no, <laughs> you know, no, of course not. <laughs> and, and they hired a guy to dub my voice in who was like a jingle singer. 
you know, he sang this famous coffee ad in America, the Folgers coffee ad. And when I met this guy, I was like, holy shit, you're the Folgers coffee guy. <laughs> I, was like, I mean, I couldn't believe, I was blown away that the Folgers coffee guy was gonna dub me. And, uh, <laughs> and he was a really nice guy. And he kept insisting to them that really he shouldn't do this because it was gonna sound ridiculous. And he was right, that the Folgers coffee guy's voice was gonna come out of my mouth. It, and that the whole point to it was that I shouldn't be a polished singer. So I ended up doing it. I had loved it, it was great. I'm gonna watch the film tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think you're gonna like what you see. <laughs> it was a long time ago. Yes, the member oh. in the front row. Thank you. And a member up here. Yeah. yeah. If you were to do a romantic comedy, who would you love to be paired beside? Wow. <laughs> Holy cow. I, the first person that came to mind was Julia Roberts. I don't know why. She does a lot of those movies, doesn't she? And would you enjoy doing it? Sure I'd enjoy doing it, yeah. I can't imagine anybody making that movie. <laughs> <laughs> the movie. The movie that we just came up with here at the Oxford Union? I don't think it's going beyond this room. <laughs> but uh, I don't know why she's the first person that occurred to me, because I was like, romantic comedies. Who's in a lot of romantic comedies? Um, yeah, she would be great, you know. I like the woman I plays my wife, Maggie Siff, on the television show that I do. I feel like I get to do romantic comic scenes with her spanking me. <laughs> and, stuff like that. and those are really fun, you know. I guess Julia Roberts, I don't know. Somebody like that. Yeah, I guess so. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Uh oh, this guy. Yeah. <laughs> I've, yeah, so Mr. Dramati, I think you also had a guest appearance on BoJack Horseman yeah. in one of the episodes. And also that show has actually quite good critique on Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So especially with the phenomenon of character actors and for example, some characters who's too widely known for some of their characters and they kind of got, got typecasted. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what your thoughts on that. Do you think there are some issues with sometimes you get played this role and people ask you to play similar roles mm -hmm. and that kind of reinforces the character? Yeah, I mean, I think very few actors aren't typecast in some way especially film actors. I mean, like inevitably, you begin, a persona begins to form around you whether you like it or not. And some people, very few people, really ever escape it hugely. Um, sometimes I feel like I am and sometimes I feel like I'm not and I don't actually really much care either way because even the roles that I feel like I may be typed in are interesting roles. You know, I mean, I play sort of wacky people, kind of complicated, jerks and weirdos and stuff and so they're interesting parts you know so I, I do find I, I get a variety of interesting stuff sometimes in the smaller roles are weirder the thing I just took now is a very bizarre role that I'm going to do so I feel like you know you can find stuff that winds it up but it's I think practically every actor is typed in some way it's almost impossible thing to avoid and it's okay it's just part of doing it I'd like to kind of draw it back to just a few final remarks. So I know that you said that sometimes you find it quite boring to do more like naturalistic type roles. Is that why you've enjoyed in your career doing quite a lot of voiceovers for animations? And what about them do you find really enjoyable? Because technically you're never on screen. Do you find yeah. it harder to convey a character? I actually find those very difficult. Yeah. Um, I find that hard. Uh, I don't think I have the most interesting voice in the world. And um, yeah, I don't love my voice. And that's just like all I have to I just you know, it's just my voice, and I don't get to sort of make funny faces and do funny things with my body. So I find that actually very difficult, and the people who are good at that, are, it's a kind of extraordinary skill. Yeah. yeah. And kind of, do, then, do you find comedy harder than perhaps a more like gritty drama role? Uh, I mean, it depends, and, and I mean, everybody always says comedy is much harder. Comedy on film is harder because you're not getting that response. Comedy on stage, it's not easy, but it's, but it's, it's great. And so I do, I do enjoy comedy quite a bit. So I think personally I enjoy comedy so it's more fun, so it's easier in that way than the gritty drama. <laughs> and kind of like if looking to the future, is there one role that you think that you really, really want to do in the next few years? or genre, or even something like on Netflix and kind of going into that 
new medium that's very much becoming Something yeah Netflix. Netflix. Oh, wow. that's very much becoming part of how we sure. consume entertainment. I never know what's going to come down the pike, and that's interesting. I mean, there's some there's some roles I'd like to play on stage. You know, um, it's a little bit dicier that those will ever happen. But there's certain there's some things I I really. There's some roles like that that I've wanted to do. With film and television stuff, I, d I, I generally don't know what's coming. Mm. And so that's, that's more interesting. Mm. And those roles on stage, which of you like, would say one? There's, a, there's a, a role I've always wanted to play, and, and I, there's got to be some way, not that hard to figure out how to do it, but there's a, a play called Rhinoceros, by, do you know rhinoceros? Uh, no, but I thought you were like, it's not the rhino. No, 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 no. isn't that weird? Wow, how weird. Do you know something I've never even cyclical. thought about the fact? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought it was like a really Wow, I've never shape. even thought about the fact. <laughs> no, that's really strange. Yeah. We've ju I've just learned something about myself too. <laughs> I'm completely self-subverting human being. I, uh, wow, it's an it's a, it's a, it's a Inesco play. It's a, it's a play that was written around the Second World War. Does anybody know this play? Do you know it? Yeah, he was a Romanian, and he, and he lived in Paris, and he wrote in French. And it's a great, absurdist play. Wow, see, nobody knows this play. It'd be great to do it. And it's all about, it's a very absurd and crazy play. And in the course of it, everybody begins to turn into rhinoceroses in the play. And there's a great, there's a character in it uh, there's a kind of a, 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 everybody turns into one except for one guy in the play, and he's left at the end in this world filled with these menacing rhinoceroses. And it's all, it was written in the Second World War, and it's all this sort of parable for fascism and stuff like that. But it's a great play, and it's a very funny and weird play, but he has a friend, and there's a, the guy's not in the play very much, but there's one remarkable scene where this guy changes into a rhinoceros on stage. And, and he has to go through this crazy transformation, and it's this long scene, and it's fantastic. And by the end of the scene, the guy's destroying the room and rampaging around the room, and it's a fantastic, crazy scene, and I've always wanted to play that part. And I didn't do it in the Spider-Man movie. No. <laughs> no. And clearly, some subconscious part of me thought I was going to well, be able to do yeah. it. <laughs> well, we'll definitely watch out for you oh. tearing off the room. Oh, I'd like okay. to say a huge thank you, Mr. Dramati, for yeah. coming to the Oxford Union today. Thanks. You're all joining me in thanking Mr. Dramati. <laughs>